Well, hello, hello, and welcome back. I'm AJ O'Neill. This is Beyond Code Live. And what we're doing tonight is we are studying this book, The Rust for Rustations by John Jinxit. And uh, last time, so basically what, what I'm doing here is I'm not going to read through it on the screen. And I actually am going to have to take a break in about an hour to put the kids to bed. But uh, I, I'm just going to pick a chapter the, in the prior two sessions I read, let's see, we did chapters, well, we did the introduction and all that, and we did chapter one, foundations, and then I was really interested in macros. And so I think, hmm, I think I got to check and see what I want to do tonight. I'm really interested in air handling. I don't know if I'm ready for that yet. Uh, if you've got any thoughts on something you particularly like to see, go ahead and make a comment now or forever hold your peace. Um... But I think I'm really interested in concurrency. I'm really interested in project structure. Uh, I think one of the thinnest chapters is error handling. So I, I think that's the one that I'll take on uh, just because of the time constraint and see what we can fit in. So I'm going to go ahead and open up to error handling. We'll just put up the chapter heading here. And then I'm, I'm just going to read to myself. And then as I have comments or thoughts or things that I want to be able to try out in the Rust Playground, I will bring those up and do so. And you're, you know, feel free to, to ask me questions or, or uh, prompt discussion. And uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't have to be on topic. It would be nice if it's something about Rust. But it's okay if we go in whatever direction we go in here. Okay, so I think this is around, what is it, Chapter 4? Okay, I'm flipping around too much. The numbers in the PDF, I'm not sure they perfectly align with the numbers in the book. All right, there's chapter 5. So, okay. That's chapter 3. If only I could find it. Come on! <laughs> you can do this! All right. Cool. So here I am. Oh, and where's my reading stand? Here we go. Let me grab my reading stand. It's very important that you have a good reading stand. Hello! Welcome! I'm AJ. I'm just cracking open the book here for myself. And then before we get started, let us have a word from our sponsor, but not really our sponsor, Mr. Mountain Dew. Right here, pop it out, my friends, for it is time to open focus. Mm. I think we're up to two or three days without incident where I don't spill on myself in the first sip or whatnot. All right. Error handling. So I'll read the introduction out loud and the rest of it I will read silently except for when I'm doing comment commentary. All right. For all but the simplest programs, you will have methods that can fail. In this chapter, we'll look at different ways to represent, handle, and propagate those failures and the advantages and drawbacks of each. We'll start by exploring different ways to represent errors, including enumeration and erasure. I'm not even familiar with the term erasure. And then examine some special error cases that require a different representation technique. Next, we'll look at various ways of handling errors and the future of error handling. Hmm. Ecosystem is not yet settled on a single approach. Interesting. Well, uh, that's the Rust ecosystem. Okay, it's more about principles and recommending specific crates. So one thing, that, the only thing that I know about error handling in Rust is there somebody, I think it was the person that did RG Rip Grip, had a blog or something about it and basically said, look, you want to optimize for the path where your code succeeds because that's normally the path that it'll take. And so I think he always does errors as pointers never or references never never as uh i think no i think it i think they're always actually pointers uh, boxes or something so that you're never optimizing for the error you're always taking out the smallest uh, the smallest space possible hmm You have two main options, enumeration and erasure. Hmm. 
Hmm, interesting. Uh, er erasure is about an opaque error. So basically it's saying here, uh, you got to consider what's what's the importance of the error to the user. Are they going to really want to be digging into all the details of it? Or is it just, you know, they need to know that something happened. You know, you got to consider, is, is, is the person going to be able to handle this error? Or is the program just going to have to exit, that kind of thing? Yeah, same thing I said before. There's cases where you just need to quit the whole program versus there's cases where you need to, say, cut off a client or discard a file. Okay, so I'll bring up his example here. I'm representing errors. Enumeration. So here we are. So here's an enum error type, very simple, makes a lot of sense. You know, if you've got a situation where you need to know if, if it was, was there an error writing to the client, if there was, you want to handle things one way. If there was an error reading in from the data source the client wanted, then you could respond to the client uh, with um, an error message that makes sense and maybe you know, send a log message or an email that something was missing or broke. But the problem with this approach, especially done like this, is that then your errors grow and grow and grow. You know, you could, there's a lot of different cases that you might want to handle. Okay. Implementation of source is straightforward. We match on self and extract and return inner error. Wait, what? Uh, for a copy error type, the implementation of source is straightforward. I don't think it gives that here. Okay, so the trait that you need to implement, you need to implement the source. Hmm. You need to implement display and debug. Display should give a one line description. And some convention about that should be lowercase without punctuation. Got it. Hmm. And debug, when implementing debug, it should give more description, more information. So display might just say error reading file. Debug might say error reading file of length from path on disk, etc. So basically, all right, so so because your error might be, there might be various different ways that you want to represent your error. It might have different properties on it. As long as it implements the display trait, then you can get the information out to the user in some sort of a sane way. Hey, thanks for joining in. I'm AJ. I'm just uh, reading the Rust book here, or not the Rust book, but Rust for Restations, the follow-up. Feel free to ask questions. I'm just reading out loud or not. I'm just reading to myself and then commenting out loud. Occasionally pulling up code samples and stuff. Okay, errors most likely need to be thread safe. Hmm. 
and the error type should have a lifetime of static. Hmm, your error type should be lifetime static. Okay, and I don't know what it's talking about. Type erased error types. I think I've run into the problem. It sounds, just that wording sounds like a problem I've run into. Because I error handling in Rust, I there was there was some program that somebody else had started that I kind of poked in, around in a little bit, but it was just the error handling was what was killing me. And that's why I'm interested in this chapter in particular. Let's see. All right, so... Enumerated errors, fairly simple. You just implement the display and the debug traits, uh, and you make sure that you don't put in things that are not multi-thread safe, such as RC or RefCell. And the lifetime should be static. Not quite what that means. I think that means that I think what it's saying there is that the error should be self-contained, that it shouldn't have reference to other things, so it shouldn't. If you need to copy information into the error, you copy the information into the error. You don't. Um, I, I think that's. I think that's what that means. That you don't have it dependent on some other function or resource. Okay, so opaque errors are for things where the program, it's not really reasonable that the program can recover from it. Um, when you say, so the error is not in flux. Hi, TC. I haven't seen you on the channel before. Welcome. Uh, when you say, so the error is not in flux, what do you mean by that? Uh, do you mean that the lifetime static so that the, the error is not in play? It's not going to going to change as it's doing whatever it needs to do then yes i think i think that so yeah okay um but so with an opaque error you're talking about uh particularly errors where they're non-recoverable errors and so there's no the 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 caller of the function can't reasonably make a choice of how to recover. So an example of this, I actually have this example, is that you're doing some sort of encoding or, or decoding, or specifically here it's talking about decoding. You're doing some sort of decoding. It doesn't matter what, what really what the reason is the decoding fails. You're not going to be able to continue from that point forward. It doesn't matter if it's because the header length didn't match the body or whatever. Um, as far as the program is concerned, there's not there's no different path it could take. So the message, the information that needs to get displayed to the developer that needs to debug it, that could still be in there. But in terms of the type of the error, whether it's a header type error or a body type error or a length type error or whatever it happens to be, isn't important. And I agree with that. There's, yeah. And then if you just have one single opaque error type, then, you know, you don't have to enumerate to handle it. So send, debug, display, an error, including the source method where appropriate. And then in your own internal program, you might have some sort of enum because there might be a way that, okay, if the header length fails, go check the footer. And if the footer length is correct, then you could use that instead. Uh, zip files work this way, where there's there's certain amounts of information throughout scattered throughout the zip file, where if one piece of information is incorrect, you can actually maybe go ahead to the next header, and then you could continue there. So you could have an error that's a skippable error, for example. So inside of your application, uh, or inside of your library, you might want to take that approach. All right, and hello to those of you joining in. I'm just uh, reading to myself and then occasionally bringing some stuff up on the screen or making comments and whatnot.
Hmm. I'll bring this up in just a second. All right. So let me go to, what is this, page 60 here? It's talking about opaque errors. And I was talking specifically, I think it's on this next page here. All right, so I, I like this example that it gives here. And I think this makes a lot of sense. In many cases, really what you want in your error is for it basically to be the most abstract type possible, which is this. Box, dine, error, plus sin, plus sync, plus static. And so what this means is that box means that it's going to be in a pointer. It's going to be on the heap. So you know what the size is. That's really important for errors is that in order for Rust programs to compile and be able to do all their checks, the size of things have to be known. So if something's an enum, the enum is going to take up the maximum size of all the types that are possible, plus a little bit of extra information for the header of the enum. Actually, no, I don't think that's necessary. I think it just needs to know the size because I think the compiler figures out the type information at compile time. Uh, and, you know, just as long as that much memory is allocated. But if you do something like this, box is on the heap, you know the size is going to be a pointer. Dyne, meaning that whatever is on the heap, I think what dyne means, dynamic, is that we don't actually know what the size of it is in advance. So you couldn't re easily return a dyne error because things get really messy if something, if the size of something can't be known. So that, I think that's the reason that's put in a box. And then with error means that it implements the traits, display, debug, and has the, the source method. And then send trait, sync trait, just means that it's multi-thread safe. And then lifetime static, meaning that it doesn't depend on any memory locations of where it came from. So this is your most, excuse me, most generic error type. And then of course, this tells the, the, the caller of the function, if this is what it gets back, it tells it basically nothing about the error. It's just, it just knows that it's gonna be able to display to the user. It's not gonna be able to introspect into any special properties. But those special properties may be used by the display and debug traits. Or the implementation of those traits rather. Okay, let's see what he's saying here. Oh, what, is, what does he say right here? With Boxdyne error, you leave your users... Hold on. I, I'm actually going to read this part. Deciding how a pick to make your error types is a matter of whether there's anything interesting about the error beyond its description. With Dyne, with Boxdyne error, you leave users with little option but to bubble up your error. That might be fine if it truly has no information or value to present to the user. If it's just a dynamic error message or if it's one of a large number of unrelated errors from deeper inside your program. But if the error has interesting facts to it, such as a line number status code, you may want to expose those to a concrete but opaque type in instead. Okay, and so I'm thinking what they mean by that is here, all it's defining is a box with traits. That's it. But you could define it with a concrete type, meaning that it is generic my library error. And that might have line number and such that is that that the caller would know how to access but it wouldn't know anything about it beyond that and i don't know why it says this different here i think it's just shorthand for this because i think that that's what what uh, he's suggesting is that that you need to have send sync and static for the error to not be obnoxious to use oh uh yeah i haven't even gone over what box is yet uh, I think that that's in the types chapter. So this book is meant to be read out of order. But box essentially means that it goes on the heap, that it's allocated memory. And I, I myself have not really done much with that. I'm very much a Rust novice. So, so this book, by its very title, uh, Rust for Rustations, idiomatic, uh, or, yeah, idiomatic Programming for Experienced Developers. I don't... 
they don't quite fit that description. I'm not an experienced Rust developer, but I kind of want to learn. I'm not ready to invest in Rust because of well, some of the decision-making issues that John had talked about. Actually, I need to make sure. So we, we at our meetup, we basically had an interview with the author kind of impromptu, and he, he joined in for our, our Rust meetup. And I need to add that to the playlist for this. So um, remind me about that. I'm going to drop a link to the Discord real quick. So if anybody wants to remind me about that, if I don't get to that tonight, um, re remind me about that. But here's the Discord. This is where you can request topics and... You know, chat with me and other people on the channel and whatnot. Hold on just one second. There we go. Invite, copy. Right, I'm going to drop this in here right now. Boop. So there's the Discord, y'all. Oh. But yeah, um, I need I need to add to the description of these sessions the playlist that I'm making out of this and definitely include the the Utah Rust meetup. But if you just search... For Utah Rust on YouTube, you can find where we had the discussion with the author, and that. But anyway, that that's squirrel coming full back, uh, full back around. Um, one of the reasons I haven't dove deeper into Rust and and used it on the daily is because there's so many decisions that the community has a hard time sticking to and putting a 1.0 stamp on and saying, yeah, this is the right way to do it. Okay, so GoLang and Rust are not. Um, super similar. Well, they there's uh, there's similarities between all programming languages. Uh, Rust is more similar to C plus plus, or yeah, really it's it's more similar to C plus uh, plus. And Go is more similar to the you know, Python, JavaScript, to some extent C. Um, Rust Rust doesn't carry all the baggage of your typical typed language, but it does have some of the the nuance and the little details that you know you don't deal with in something like going all right oh yeah here we go I, and I'll, I'll read this quote too so in in general the community consensus is the error should be rare and therefore should not add much cost to the happy path for that reason errors are often placed behind a pointer type such as a box or arc an arc is an automatic reference count so box is you're keeping track of the pointer, and uh, I think you decide when to deallocate it. I'm trying to remember the scoping rules around box. Arc, automatic reference count, is when all of the references have been dropped, excuse me, then the, the whole memory location is dropped. All right, this way they're either... This way, they're unlikely to add much to the size of the overall result type they're contained with it. And, and then you get the performance benefits of that as well. And so, yeah, this is, this was just one of those light bulb moments for me of, duh, that makes total sense. You want your, you, you don't, you don't want to optimize for your error. You want to optimize for your successful result. And so, you know, saying when there's an error, it has to do an extra look up past the pointer to the heap. Who cares? Because then you can fulfill all of these conditions about being sync, send, static, etc. very easily. All right. Yeah, and the problem he's talking about here is the problem that I ran into, uh, which is when you return very specific types of errors rather than the more generic type of error, then you have to have a way to handle that. So if your application receives an error and then you're bubbling up that error, then that means that the calling application needs to handle your error types plus the error types of the library that you call plus the error types of the library that it calls. Whereas if you just kind of think, okay, what you know how close to the metal does the the caller need to be then you erase that type information replace it with a more generic type or at least a concrete type and then the calling function doesn't have to have a list of potentially impossible um, error conditions where they they have to transform the error in some weird way or do something that's really hokey that that was, I can't remember exactly the problem that I had but it was with one of the HTTP servers and and I 
there, there's just a bunch of different errors that I had to handle and they basically had incompatible types and I couldn't stuff one to the other and I didn't know enough about Rust at the time. It was just frustrating. All right. So yeah, using more generic error type makes it compositional. Okay, static is really important. Oh, downcasting. I don't know what that means. That's a new term for me. And actually, you know, I said I said I was going to be highlighting in this book as I read it, and I have not been highlighting yet, but you know, it books, technical books are meant to be utilized. They're they're a tool, they're consum consumable. Uh, you know, you're not going to resell them, or if you you shouldn't buy a book with the a technical book with the idea that you're going to resell it or something. So, mark it up, make it yours. Uh, there was some other term that was new to me um, that we came across a little bit earlier. If somebody remembers what that term was and you want to shout it out to me real quick, that'd be great. We've only gone in here like three pages so far, so it's got to be here somewhere. But there was, uh, oh, type erased. That was just the generic term that they were using. Okay, let me see if I can find this. Where was type erased? Okay. Yeah, I'm just going to highlight some things so that when I come back to this for myself, I've got it. Okay, there was the, the standard error trait, error source, um... Display and debug, and then saying the error description was was the old way, kind of deprecated. You want to make it static if at all you can. Uh, type erased. There we go. Now I've highlighted all the things that were important to me about this. Okay, cool. All right, and uh, let me see a comment here. Does this differ generic error messages and panic like exit handlers? Okay, so first of all, I'm I the term generic means a couple of different things, and I was using it very generically. No pun intended. Well, kind of pun was intended at that point. Otherwise, I wouldn't have had the little thing that I did. But uh, so. I, what I meant is a nondescript error is what he's calling a type erased error. So I, let me read it that way. Does the does this type erased does this differ type erased error messages and panic like exit handlers? Uh, so you ideally you don't want to panic and rusted is called panic as well. Ideally you don't want to panic. Um, you want to return your error all the way back to the point where your main function then prints out an error and exits. Uh, I think there are some cases for panicking, uh, but I don't remember quite what they are. But essentially, the same rules apply uh, across Go and Rust in terms of don't panic. That's not something that you want to do because there are ways, there, there is a little bit of a trick you can do in Go with the panic recover. There are situations where that's useful. And I, uh, I think kind of like what's mentioned here, there are cases where, for example, in Go, JSON used to panic uh, and recover. And this is kind of nice because it allows you to keep all the internal implementation detail of the errors in that package and just not worry about them and say, Hey, look, I'm not going to handle all these errors. If there's a parse error that occurs, yeah, I might want it for debugging, but I'm just going to panic recover to just catch it because doing all the error handling in every single place that there could be an error is kind of tedious. And so I think that that, that kind of thing makes sense. Uh, but in general, you don't want, you don't want to, if you panic, then you should be doing the recover basically inside of that same library. Uh, you shouldn't be allowing it to propagate to a point where it would cause the program to exit. If you are using a panic artistically or stylistically, it, it should not escape the bounds. And I don't remember how Rust handles recover. It may not. It may be that panic is just a straight exit. But yeah, you can panic with an error, but 
it's not recommended. That's something that's really just for debugging and, you know, quick one-offs. It should never make it into, you know, hopefully not even committed code other than a whip commit or something and not production code. And that's true of any language. You just don't want to screw people's programs up. All right, so now we're going to learn about downcasting, whatever that is. Okay. Downcasting is the process. Uh, you know, we're just going to bring this up on page. Was This is page 60. Are we just a little bit lower on this page? Yeah, it takes three hours to read 15 pages out of this book. The reading's fast, but then the processing is uh, difficult. Here we go. I haven't read this yet, so we'll be reading it together. Huh, that's interesting. Downcasting is the process of taking an item of one type and casting it to a more specific type. So we're going to go from our box dine error, and we're going to downcast it to something that's got more meaning. I wonder how we would do that. How would we even know? Um, I'm interested to find out. Hmm. One of the few cases where Rust gives you access to type information at runtime. Hmm. Hmm. Interesting. I wonder how that works. Yeah. Limited case of more general type reflection. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so there's a downcast ref. I don't know if this is a method or a trait. I'm I'm a, I need to I need to read the types chapter next. That's going to make my head hurt. But I need to get a better understanding of the syntactical significance of using a double colon with a title case word versus using a double colon with a snake case word because they mean different things. I think when it's title case, it's a trait. And I think that when it's a snake case, I think it's a static method that belongs to that um, package or namespace. But anyway, basically what it's saying is you can try, you can, you can use the option type. So you can try to downcast an error to a specific type. So you, you won't necessarily be able to enumerate it, but you can say, I'm guessing that this probably this error that I got back that when I called this function, I'm guessing is probably of this type. So I'm going to try to downcast it to this particular type because I actually can handle it. I actually do care. I actually do think, okay, if the header was corrupt to this image file, I'm going to read the footer, and if I can find the size data there, I'll manually update the header, resize the, the file, and, and tell it to parse again, or, you know, who knows what. But So it's, you, you wouldn't be able to do it exhaustively. You would, you'd do it on a case-by-case -case basis, and you just use the option. So that kind of makes sense. And for those of you that don't know what the option is. TC, by the way, you so you come from Go. You said you're relatively new, or you're just relatively new to to Go. I mean to to Rust. Let's see. Uh, close thing. I'm a beginner. Um, so option. It, it, Rust, uh, Golang does not have enums, and Rust does have enums, and it's not enums in the way that C style languages have enums, which are just constants for for numbers that go from zero to whatever. Uh, an enum is a type. So you could say that I'm enumerating. This is either a string or a number, which that's kind of a silly thing. But let's say, let's say we have an audio type and the audio is enumerated as it's either MP3 or AUG or AAC. It's one of these, and, and then maybe we could further enumerate that, that it's uh, MP3, H-E, A-A-C, H-E, 
So maybe there's five types that you could enumer enumerate, but you know, you don't really care about that most of the time. You just care, hey, here's some audio. I can tell it to play. I can tell it to decode. I can get out samples that I can put out to the, the speakers. But if you need to do something specific, you can enumerate and say, oh, well, if this is an MP3, then I'll get the header information for the title this way. If it's an AUG, I'll do it this way. And I think AUG files can have multiple different I think they can have more than one record for a header, stuff like that. So that's what an enum is. It allows you to specify kind of a parent type and then occasionally when you need to be able to select down and say, well, this parent type is exactly one of these five types here. And so you can match on them. Hey, M. Houston, what's up? Nice to see you again. Welcome back. How are you doing? And feel free to, you know, those of you that as you come in and going, if you do like this, if you find it entertaining or useful or you learn something, give it a thumbs up, consider a sub or follow. It is my birthday coming up in six months, almost to the day, I'm trying to hit 5k, uh, follow, follows and subs by my birthday. So if you want to do that, appreciate it. Early birthday present. Um, let's see, where was I? All right. So I get, the, I get the downcast thing. This makes sense. Oh, okay. There's some disagreement in the ecosystem about whether type raised error, type erased errors are part of its public and stable API. Yeah, that makes sense. Hmm. I would say that if you type erase the error, then, hmm. Yeah, that's a good point, because this comes into play with downcasting. Because if you know internally it uses this error type, then you might want to to downcast to it. Hmm. I think that definitely should be mentioned in the documentation if you you know if you know that it is or isn't stable. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I like what he says here. I'm gonna I'm gonna bring this up too. Hopefully, I'm not bringing up too much of his work verbatim here. But I I think what he says uh, right here makes a lot of sense. So if you have a method foo in your library that returns lib my error as a box dine error, so you've we wrapped it to erase the types, would changing foo to return a different error type be a breaking change? And I think this is a very sensible answer. Uh, no, it isn't because you, it, you explicitly chose to hide it. So you explicitly removed that from the user's purview. So unless you document otherwise, that's not a breaking change. I think that's fair. Entry. Interesting. A box dine error does not automatically implement error. So you need to create your own box type. All right, box error type. That's interesting. What I, what I find yeah. is the Rust people are so strict about if there's any possibility that you could implement something in a more efficient way, if it isn't bare metal C, which I think this is a fair argument for what Rust is and the, the niche it fills, that they don't, they don't make that decision. There's always... Well, it, there typically doesn't need to be an escape hatch because the default is, is bare metal. Uh, I think that they could do a little bit better about that personally um, because I think there's a lot of, if you just go with that approach, the naive approaches are often slower and less efficient than a uh, approach that 99.9% .9 of the time is going to be right and only in a really weird edge case is going to have some sort of drawback. Um, 
but anyway, I, I'm, I'm interested to know if this, I'm, I'm assuming it must be handled. No, cause it said runtime. It said, it said there was a runtime to the downcasting. It gives you access to type information at runtime, but it seems that it must know at compile time cause it's doing the option bit. But I guess what it's saying is that there must, in a, in a box dine, whatever, there must be just a little bit of type information that's allowed to be in there, and that's just an inefficiency that you accept by using it. Let me see. Let me read further along and see if I understand it any differently. Also, usually I'm a bit more animated tonight. I'm a little just kind of. Well, I guess it's actually every other time I'm a bit more animated. Every day that I get enough sleep and caffeine, I'm great. And then every other day, I'm a little bit more low-key. Okay. Standard any type ID. Blanket implementation for all types. Oh, yeah, yeah, okay, so you, it has to have a V table still. That makes sense, duh. Yeah, 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 that's why, that's, I think that's what dine was supposed to be in reference to, is that when you do dine on something, then you, you accept that it's got the V table lookup stuff, which is C++ stuff. I guess it also is, would be all dynamic languages, probably have that. I'm reading slow, sorry. Okay, special error cases, let's see. Interesting. Okay, so there's a case where maybe there's nothing, there's just nothing of value about an error other than to know that an error happened. And there's a distinction between an option, which gives you a result, it uh, gives you something, sorry, an option gives you something or none, but this is not an error. This is simply that there was nothing to do the, the the you've encountered the empty set or some such so you know when you iterate over something that's iterable every turn of the iteration you might be pulling out an option and if the option is none then you've reached the end and you're free to break and continue the rest of the execution so this is a case where it's not an error, it's none. And so there's a distinction between using an option and using a result with an empty error. A result with an empty error signifies that there was in fact an error. It's not just that there is none, it's that there is an error, but that uh, for, for whatever reason, there's nothing meaningful that can be conveyed about it. Okay, and so when it comes to when it comes to certain, I guess, I guess linting of the language, or this might be enforced by the compiler. There's a, a must use macro that's an annotation that's on result, which means that it's an error if you do not check it exhaustively, if you do not exhaustively choose what to do. However, an option does not have that. An option you can use the result or the none, or you cannot. It doesn't matter. It's at your option. So that makes sense. Ah, and also, of course, I forget, what was it called? The unit type, the, the empty tuple in Rust, uh, does not implement the error trait. 
So it cannot be typed, type erased into a Boxdyne error. Yeah. Oh, and another thing we were talking about this earlier. I didn't. I was thinking it. I didn't say it out loud. But the the, the question mark error chaining. That's another reason that it's port, important to be able to. If, when you type erase the error, that that was one of the things I was running into specifically. If you type erase the error, then you can do the question mark chaining, and you can let it bubble up as a generic error anywhere where, you know, the generic error can go from place to place to place, right? Um, but if you have to enumerate the error and handle it specifically, then you need to have a match on that. And then the match needs to re return, sorry, I'm using the term generic in the English sense rather than the programming sense this whole time, I think. Um, but then you, you can, a, a type erased, that's the appropriate term here, uh, you, can, you can match on the errors and then return a type erased error that can continue to bubble up. And so you can't do that with with the unit value, the, the empty tuple. Uh, where are you in the text right now? I am in, I'm on page 62. Uh, I'm just about to hit propagating errors. Well, actually, no, I'm actually at the top where the note is. So... Oh, interesting. So the bang can be used to mean that th that that type will never be used. So for example, if you do panic for whatever reason and you're going to execute or you're going to to exit the program, then what you could do is set the error type to be bang. And if the error type is bang, then it knows that it will never be used. And so you don't have to define it. So if you have a result and you say, well, this is going to return a result or it's going to panic, then you can use bang. And similarly, uh, if you had a result where it was, I think if, if the, the purpose is it's going to go into an infinite loop, not a bad one, but a purposeful one where that's, the, the program running means that it's going to loop continuously. That's what the program is intended to do, is to continually accept input or something. Then on the result type, I suppose you could do the opposite and say, if there's an error that causes the server to shut down, the result would, would be the error. But the only way that this function would ever return a result would be if it's an error. And so you could put the bang for the first part of the result. If, I, if I'm understanding this correctly, explicitly gives the, the error condition, but I, if I'm reading it right, you could do the other as well. Okay, so it doesn't generate any panic code or unwrap code or whatever. So it just, it just optimizes away. It cancels some of the checks and optimizes away some of the safety net that would be there. Huh. Uh, there's a type alias here that I don't quite understand. I need to look at this for a second. Hmm.
Ah, uh, okay. Okay, I was going to say this earlier, but I wasn't sure, and so for one rare occasion I actually kept my mouth shut rather than just blurting out what my thoughts are. But it seems to be the case. So one of the cases where you might panic is in a thread. Because the thread may not be able to reasonably return an error. So you panic. And there's a particular case where the, the, the result type is actually of an the error is in any type of box dine any send static. Let me just scroll down to this part. Yeah, so this bit right here. I thought that's kind of interesting. And the reason is because it's a panic. And so uh, because it's handling a panic, it handles any. So I, I don't know why it's not a bang in this case. I guess it's because it's not exclusionary. I don't, maybe I need to just read that section underneath slower. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, because panic normally panics with a format string, but it could be any type. So because you can panic on any type, therefore it's any because it's a panic. Got it. Okay. Uh, autopilot escape hatch. Uh, so there's a delay between when I, well, when you see things appear here, and basically the delay between when you see it appear here and when I see it is the delay of the video stream. So I'm not sure what that was in reference to. So if you give me a little more context, I might be able to respond to it. But I I think maybe maybe that was in reference to the bang. In which case, yes, that sounds right. Okay. Yes, I've had trouble with the from trait. Ah. E from, ah, oh, anxiety. Okay. Okay. Oh, yeah, from and into. I remember that's, it's all coming back to me now. There was innumerable error types. One of them was... I think it was actually an async type, so it wasn't an error directly. It was an async type, and I async wasn't well standardized back then at all, at all. And I didn't know what to do about it. And I couldn't figure out how to make this call and then return an error because the function that the trait that I needed to fulfill or something had a specific error type, and because because there wasn't a wait, I, I couldn't even know if there was an error, and then I had to implement this from and into for these different uh, enumerations or something. It's, it's all, you know, it's it, it's been blocked out of my memory. It was a bad experience. Okay, something about chapter two that I haven't read yet. Coherence rules. I don't know what that means, but we'll get to it in chapter two. Next time, I think I'll read chapter two. But about from and into here. Interesting. So I guess from and into aren't both necessary now because of coherence rules, whatever that means. And so they both stick around. Oh, but there's ergonomic reasons for both of these traits. Good.
Uh, maybe a one too many angle brackets in this example here. But basically it's just it's a side note on from and into. I'm gonna have to read chapter two to really understand it. Let me see how much we have left here, because I, okay, page and a half, good, because I've got about 15 minutes, then I need to put kiddos to bed. Hmm. So, when you do the question mark operator to do error chaining, of whether it should unwrap the error or return early, it relies on the implementation of the from. Again, I want to use the right word here. The from conversion trait. But in the future, it might be able to use into as well. Okay, so the from and into thing is basically this. Um, you're defining a trait of, I want this to be able to be created from that. So I want bacon to be able to create it from the piggy and then the other one is the inverse is I want to turn the bacon into a piggy so you implement one on the one and one on the other and the reason that I solve for both of these is that uh, if I remember correctly one of them you can implement in your own code so if I have my own type I can specify that I want my type to have a from method, from implementation for some other type. So if I have my type erased error type and I want to match on some other types of libraries that I'm using, then I could do that. Well, I, I think I could, I could skip having to do that if I have my error implementing a from that's for the other error type. So I could have my error from error type one, from error type two, from error type three, from error type four. That way, when I do an optional chaining, if my return signature requires my type erased error type, I can do the chaining with the question mark and then it will just use the from that I've defined even though from hasn't been defined uh, by the the lib. Well, obviously the into has not been defined by the library because because it would it would not know about my types. It would not know how to convert into my types because it doesn't use my types. I'm using it, not it using me. So privately within the scope of my library, I can implement a from for it for my types. I think that was the issue that I was having. And I'm not really quite sure what this coherence thing is. We'll find about, out about it in chapter two, but I'm guessing that it has to do with uh, probably for standard types that are available everywhere, the ints, the floats, the strings, the stir, etc. There's probably some sort of... Uh, if you implement the into, you don't need to implement the from or something or other. I, I don't know exactly. And I may have explained that perfectly backwards. And maybe that I have to implement the into for mine for it to go. But you, you get the basic picture. You want to side grade from one type to another type. I also did this for, it was an audio waveform. So I worked on, on the Sonos platform. 
and this is one of my cool claim to fames of you know, consumer electronics that lots of people have in their home. I worked on uh, Sonos Radio, and that was predominantly where I used Rust because of the certain performance characteristics that they needed and the environment that it was going to be run. It turns out, I don't know that we could have done it and go, it would have been fine, but it was cool to do it in Rust. And I basically, well, I won't go into too many details of it, but um, there's different audio files have different uh, bit depths to them. So you can have 16-bit audio, 24-bit audio. And one of the things that I had to do was I, I had this, this conversion bit where if it was going from one type to another type, it would automatically do the multiplication to convert uh, whatever value it was to the value that it needed to be. Because if you're going from 16-bit to 24-bit, which is actually you have to use the, the memory of a 32-bit, but if you were going between those two or those three, I, I think there was also some that might, might have even used a float 64. It was int. There's some, some audio codecs use int, others use float, and there's different bit depths. And I, I, I remember that much about it. And essentially, I had it so that it, it would, for, for certain math that had to be done, I think it was for the audio limiter, uh, or, yeah, I think that's what it was. We had to have it automatically convert back and forth between int and float, but not just carry the value. It's not, oh, well, this is 2, so when it's float, it's going to be a 2. No, because the float was between 0 and 1. And the two was relative to if it was 16 bit, the 65,000, the you know the 64k, and so on and so forth. And so it had to convert its ratios back and forth, and then it had to carry the one, because if it was negative, then you can go negative to what is it negative 64k minus or I guess plus one, but if it's positive, then you can go up to an even 64k, right? And so that was, uh, I don't know if that was a good way to solve it or if it was a clever way to solve it. I think it ended up being the right way to solve it. I think it was appropriate given the way that Rust handles types and stuff. It was interesting to me. I'm always hesitant when I say it was cool because if it, if it seems cool, it's usually a bad idea for programmers because you don't want stuff to be unintuitive and look neat. You want it to be correct and to work right and to be easy for people that have shared understanding and when people use the word cool they generally mean the opposite of that but anyway that was that was uh uh the case where i used this and it was it was just kind of it was neat it worked out i liked it all right second aspect of the question mark to be aware of is that the operator is really just syntax sugar <gasps> For a trait tentatively called try. Okay, so we don't even know what the trait's called, huh? All right, whatever. At the time of this writing, the try trait has not yet been stabilized. But by the time you read this, it's likely that it or something very similar will have been settled on. Since the details have not all been figured out, I'll give you only the outline of how try works. Oh, now I'm reading the whole thing out loud. All right, mom's the word. Buy the book if you want it. But, you know... I'll give you the juicy bits. Hmm. Oh no, the word monads. <laughs> oh, oof. I had a little panic attack. We're going to be okay, y'all. It's going to be all right. Let me try this again. Some of you will correctly think of monads, though we won't explore that connection here. Okay. Whew. You should have started with, though we won't explore that connection here, some of you may think of this as dot, 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 lowercase, in parens, shushed monads. You know, not to scare the folks like us away. I, I was about to have a panic attack. So... The,
Okay, so it's saying basically that the the try operator, now we have a name for it. <laughs> well, he calls it question mark operator because we're not calling it try yet because we don't know what the real name is going to be. I think try sounds perfect for this description. Basically, he's saying that anything, whether it's a result, it's an option, it's a poll, uh, anything that basically has two paths, one where you can continue and do something useful, and the other where you can't and you need to exit early, uh, will be usable if it is not already. The goal is to make all of those usable with the question mark operator. Um, I, I don't know much about doc tests. I'm assuming that's where you put a test comment in the documentation and it can run a thing. I don't know. Yeah. Oh, by the way, before you hit checkout, I just want to warn you. So that's my affiliate link in the description, which is why it's there. But if you go to, and by the way, I had to pay 40 bucks for this. Now on Amazon, it's only 25. I guess it didn't sell well enough and they discounted the price or something. But this is the part that stinks, okay? If you get it on Amazon, you don't get the ebook. Now, some of us of questionable scruples... Well, if you Google the title of the book, the first thing that comes up is the Russian website with the PDF download. So it's not like I was even, you know, I was, anyway, you can get the ebook fairly easily, but it comes with it if you buy it from No Starch Press. Now, No Starch Press is a little bit more expensive than Amazon, but anyway, I just, I felt, sometimes I feel ripped off on Amazon because it turns out, well, if you'd bought this from Best Buy, Best Buy and pre-ordered it six months in advance, you would have gotten the special edition that includes the stuff. You pre-ordered it on Amazon and you get punked. And that just upsets me, you know? I've had this happen several times. Basically, don't ever pre-order on Amazon. Anywhere else that you can pre-order, because I didn't get the advanced copy of the ebook when I pre-ordered on Amazon, and all my friends did, you know? And when I pre-ordered my Zelda stuff on Amazon, I didn't get the music CD, but my friends did, they got it from GameStop or Best Buy or whatever, you know, so just don't ever pre-order anything on Amazon. Pre-order it from the place that's going to give you the rewards for being a pre-orderer. Okay, let, let me finish reading this example here. All right, this function listing is perfectly normal. A result, a result, you can return a result of nothing or an error. It can do, do some stuff. It has to OK at the end. Yeah. I love wood. Wait. Oh, what? Huh? Oh. 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 I get that. So Go has a defer and try blocks. Uh, okay, this this makes perfect sense. I'm going to show you this because this is I like this. This is beautiful. This is one of those things that's just it's just elegant. It's kind of sexy, but not in a bad way. You know, because sexy is kind of like cool. You want to avoid it like the plague when it comes to programming. Programming should be boring and reliable. But this. This just warms the cockles of my heart a little bit. So I, I didn't catch this right away. So thing.cleanup, yeah. So if we want setup, if setup fails in some part, then we've got, you know, whatever thing is, it's a little bit dirty, right? And so we actually want to be able to do the the cleanup phase of this of this thing because if, if something fails in the setup phase, we just want to make sure, you know, if we created some directories, we uncreate the directories, whatever. So this makes sense. So, oh, no, 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 no. No, sorry, that, that was not right. Because if the setup fails, we, we don't know what to do. But anything that happens in here that could go wrong, yeah, that's, okay. Anything anything that uses the thing that could go wrong, if that goes wrong and it goes straight to error, then it does do cleanup. But we want the cleanup to happen. That's what it's saying. So here you go. So here, if you use a try then you can get back whatever R is, which I guess is going to be okay for your result here. It's going to be either okay or it's going to be an error. And so then you can always do your cleanup thing and then you can do this. That's just, it just, 
Makes my heart happy. Does it make your heart happy? Let's see. True multi threadings. We'll get there. All right. Multi step fallible function that always cleans up after itself. Okay. No, try blocks are not not stable at the time of this writing. I the the funny thing is I thought that I'd used a try block a, a couple years back. Maybe I didn't. Cuz when I saw this, I wasn't blown away in the sense of oh wait, I've never seen that before. I felt more like, oh, I did I, I almost didn't remember this. But maybe it's because if if is also this way and so is match. And so maybe I was just having a little bit of uh vuja day. Uh, in relation to the way that if works. Because if is an expression. I do, there's so many things about Rust that are really nice. Just ergonomic, aesthetic stuff that's, you know. If being an expression, that's nice. That makes sense. Oh, scratch the last comment. Okay. So, I, yeah, I was a little confused but I was going with it. Maybe I shouldn't have. Maybe that was disingenuous. But I thought maybe you were looking at something about the book where it talks about multi-threading and you were commenting about that because I didn't say anything about multi-threading. All right. Okay. Yeah, it's general consensus. They're useful. Okay. And it's about time for me to go. Enumeration, erasure... Advantages and drawbacks. So I, I, this book is meant to be reference material just as much or perhaps I think more so than it's meant to be read cover to cover. When you encounter a problem, this is meant to be kind of a cookbook of, okay, what's the idiomatic way to do this? And so there's, there's one section that I didn't read too carefully because there's just too many angle brackets. My brain can't handle them. Um, I'm not, I, I'm a smart guy. But Rust makes me feel stupid. And that's okay. I need the humility. Um, but I'll, I'll come back to this when I need it. I know it's here now. I just, I love the high level concept stuff in this book. I think it's really great. I wish there were more examples. It's a little bit too much on the trim the fat side for my liking. But still, I get a lot of value out, out of it. It's worth every penny. All right. Oh, and by the way, uh, thank you for supporting my affiliate. I appreciate that. I'll, I'm going to take that 50 cents. Put it towards the Mountain Dew. Thank you. I had to start plugging that. I start plugging that from now on. By the way, check the descriptions for affiliate links. Every link you click buys this man a Mountain Dew. Okay, I'm trying to get through the summary here. Okay, cool. So I'm pretty convinced that the next time we do a Rust study sesh, we're going to do chapter two. I think that's the right thing to do next. And then we might bounce around a little bit more. Let me take a look. So I'm going to bring back up the chapter listing. Y'all tell me what you think, because I'll, I'll take a little bit of that input. I mean, I got to do what's right for me, you know, but... We'll take a little bit of that input and kind of see. So I'll give you all the link again. Uh, let me let me uh, give you the link again to the Discord. So if you want to pop in the Discord, you can. Um, and remind me if you don't see it pop up. But I'm going to put. Let me go, just go do that now, real quick. No, I need it. It's it's past nine thirty. It's nine thirty five. I need to get upstairs and help put the kids to bed. Um, but. Uh, so, so I'll come back. I'll do that afterwards. When I come back down, I'll, I'll update the links for the things I was talking about where we, we got to have an, an, an ad hoc interview with the author at the Utah Rust meetup. And I'll put this video in the playlist and I don't remember what else I was going to do, but remind me if I need to do it. Anyway, so we, we did foundations. Oh, I need to put the playlist in the descriptions is what I need to do. Um, 
We did macros. Whoops, that's not what I wanted to do. Can we go back, please? That's the one thing that I do not like about this program is I can't figure out how to go back once I accidentally click on something that doesn't look like it's clickable. Um, so types is next. And then I, designing interfaces after types, I'm going to need a few hammers to the old brain bone <laughs> and, and to do something that is just more friendly and makes my heart feel good, like project structure or maybe... Mm, uh, it's, I don't know, something else in here. Um, and then we could go back to designing interfaces. But I am really interested in, I think unsafe code will probably be the last thing that I read. Um, I don't know, maybe that, I, I don't know, I don't know. We'll see. Anyway, but if you want to cast your vote for something, go ahead and let me know. And uh, yeah, feel free to hop in the Discord uh, with uh, comments or thoughts. Thank you for joining in. I really appreciated the conversation. TC in particular, also M. Hewton, just thanks for stopping by and saying hi for whoever whoever else is in here. Um, thanks for being here with me and studying with me. I appreciate it. Um, uh, despite my calm and collected demeanor today, I want to remind you all that I am an equal opportunity offender, so I don't want to give any newcomers the wrong impression. Uh, <clears throat> I'm a dangerous wrong thinker, so you know, join and follow at your peril. Um, but yeah, uh, uh, this was good. I appreciate it. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did give it a like, consider a follow and a sub for my birthday, which is only six months away and I will catch you later. Adios.